Seeing is believing. If you don't believe it, many of you know that in the last week we saw a ancient landmark in Paris burned to the ground. 850 years old, the Cathedral of Notre Dame. In less than 12 hours, fire completely destroyed that cathedral that stood for all those centuries. And of course, there's a vow to rebuild it. But I will, I won't ask for hands today, but I will bet <laughs> that almost everyone who heard about this news of the devastation of this fire in France, the first thing you did was, I need to see it. <laughs> I need to see this for myself. And of course, we live in an age where you can hop on the internet or you can turn on the television and you can see live images of those flames leaping and of, the, of the, the great spire collapsing and of the firemen putting their, their, their best efforts at, at saving that cathedral and putting out that fire. And the fact is, knowing and hearing, reading it in the newspaper, didn't mean much until we saw it ourselves. You know, that's true with a lot of things we have in life. We, we don't just want to hear about it. We want to see it. You know, I have little kids in my house. I have two two-year-olds and a three-year-old. and They keep changing ages, so you can't ever always remember, you know. <laughs> they don't ever stay still. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, what, what happens with little kids? They, they, want, they, they see something. They get excited. What's the first thing? You've got to come see this, Right? My little kids, they like to sit in the window, and they, they, uh, there's a bird feeder out there, and they see the birds, every bird that comes by. I have to be brought over to see it because you have to see this. Like, I haven't seen a bird before, you know. Okay, there's another chickadee out there. There's another dove, whatever. No, they get excited. They have to show it to you because seeing is believing, right? Newspapers would be pretty dull <laughs> if they didn't put any pictures in them, right? We like to see the news, and they say a picture is worth a thousand words, right? But seeing is believing. People need to see, they need to experience firsthand evidence, not just being told about it. And I want to look this morning at the many different times we see just in this one passage in Matthew 28 of how seeing is a key part of Jesus' evidence of his resurrection. There were many people that saw. They didn't always see him face to face, but they saw with different eyes. You remember Jesus all through his ministry, he used to say often, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear, or he that hath eyes to see, let him see. In other words, not everybody that sees is always going to believe. Not everyone that sees has evidence in front of them is always going to get it. But the fact of the matter is he wants us all to get this message. Over and over again, he tries to provide evidence to let us see the truth of the resurrection so that we might believe in it. The first group that I want to just mention comes right here in verse 1. We see these women, and they're described in greater detail in some of the other Gospels. But here it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. They came to see the sepulcher. Now, what were they doing? Why did they want to come see a sepulcher? I mean, the stone was there. There were guards. They weren't going to get to see anything. Well, the fact of the matter is, what do we know about these ladies? Well, they had prepared spices. They had prepared ointments. They had prepared things to handle this body which was quickly taken off the cross and put in the grave and they weren't able to get access to it for the last couple of days and they knew that it needed a proper treatment and a proper burial and so they had gathered all of their things to make something of this burial that was proper but they knew the whole city knew <laughs> that this tomb was sealed up it had the seal on it. It was not to be broken. The guards were put in place so that no one would come and make it open. So when these ladies said they came to see the sepulcher, what were they seeing with? They were seeing with eyes of faith. Eyes of faith that somehow, in some manner, God was going to somehow open this tomb and give them access to be able to take care of Jesus' body. 
They had to come with eyes of faith. They had prepared these spices. They made these preparations. And even though they knew there were a lot of obstacles in the way, whether they be stone obstacles or human obstacles, they still came to see with anticipation, with the expectation that they were going to find access to Jesus' body. You know, that asks the question of us. How often do we see beyond our circumstances with eyes of faith? Does we see beyond the obstacles in front of us that maybe life throws our way and we see something beyond that? We see maybe something that God wants to do in it. We see something that's a greater purpose that maybe God has for us in it. God wants us to see with eyes of faith too. And of course, we only see with those eyes of faith in this day and age when we first have trusted in Christ and he, we've put our faith in him. But these women, they came with eyes of faith. But we see a second group. We see in verses 2 through 5, the guards, the watchmen. It says, Behold, here's what occurred. Behold, there was a great earthquake in verse 2. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. Look at all the description and detail here. This was something that was described from a first-hand account of what really happened. It says, and for fear of him, verse 4, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. You know, the guards who were there, they came not with eyes of faith. When they saw the events, when they witnessed this event that took place to roll the stone back and the angel and the countenance thereof, they had eyes of fear. <laughs> they had eyes of fear when they witnessed this. They didn't know what to make of it. They were afraid. It says they were as dead men. They were just so paralyzed with fear, they didn't even know where to go, what to, what to do, how to even move. We've ever been in a situation like that? where some event is so traumatic, some event is so uh, spectacular, and we don't even know how to react. We're just paralyzed sometimes with, with fear in, in the sense that, that this was a fearful thing. And any angel that could come from heaven and roll back a stone, who knows what he could do to them? <laughs> I'm sure there was some fear, personal fear. Broke the seal to the entrance. His countenance was like lightning. His raiment white as snow. All of these things indicate his power. The white, being white as snow indicates his holiness. And you notice that the angel, because these were unbelieving guards, these did guards weren't there with eyes of faith uh, protecting their Savior. No, they were there just because it was another job to do. <laughs> and you notice when the angel says, fear not ye, what does he say in verse, in, in verse uh, 5? The angel answered and said unto the women, fear not ye. Remember the women that came with eyes of faith, they were there seeing this whole thing happen as well. And the guards didn't get addressed by the angel. The women did. They were the ones that came with faith. And he only told the women not to fear. Because you know, the fact of the matter is, when you don't know the Lord, when you're not in a fellowship with him, you have something to fear. Something that's missing in our society today is a fear of the awesomeness, the greatness, the power of God. We, we like to paint God or Jesus Christ as, you know, the chum that we go and hang out with. As the, as the guy around the corner that he's a good guy and he helps me out. We like to paint God as, you know, a friend and a guy, a guy who loves us and, you know, he's just a, another guy. There's a lot of people in the world that like to paint God at our level. But the fact of the matter is, God is a powerful God. God is an all-knowing God. He is an all-present God, and He is an all-powerful God. We must not forget that we, have, <laughs> we should have a fear of God in our lives, a fear of what He can do, a fear of who He is, of His awesome power. He doesn't even need to react in order to, to completely change the circumstances of our life. How big is the God that you serve? You come to know Christ as your Savior. You say, I'm, I'm going to be serving God with my life. How big is that God? 
Is he big enough to handle your problems? Is he big enough to put boulders out of your way? <laughs> is he big enough to strike fear in you? The fact of the matter is, though, while we need to remain and un have an understanding of, God, of the fear of God, the fact of the matter is the faith in God trumps the fear of God. When we accept Christ as our Savior, when we put our faith in Him, we see the ladies come and say, they're witness to this great fearful thing that happened. This angel was in front of them too. They saw this awesome power. And what did the angel say? Yes, don't forget all this power of God, but remember, you don't need to fear <laughs> because all of this power is for you. It's for your benefit. And as Christians, we need to know that that power of God, that fear doesn't need to consume us in terms of worry or anxiety or, or problems in our life. No, God says all of that power is to empower you as Christians. So we see the guards, they had eyes of fear. The women had eyes of faith. And then let's look at one other character. We see in verses 6 and 7. The angel himself says to the women, He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him. Lo, I have told you. What does the angel bring to the story? The angel wants them to understand that what they have seen, they need to see with eyes of fulfillment. They were, they were to see all of these events that they just witnessed and they were trying to process. I don't know if you had ever thought about this. You go out planning to do one thing and all of a sudden, wow, lightning strikes. And what happens? I don't, I don't know what to do. What do I make of this? How do I process this? Sometimes... Events happen in our life very quickly, very suddenly. And we're, I don't know how to process this. I don't know what to do with it. So the angel says, I'm going to help you to understand how to process these events. He says, the fact is, all of these events are in fulfillment of prophecies from all of the Old Testament, but also of the prophecies that Jesus Christ himself made to you. He says, see the place where the Lord lay. This was part of the prophecy. The tomb is empty. He said, and then tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Make sure that other people know that this prophecy has been fulfilled, that you've seen it with your own eyes. And you know, this angel didn't just happen to arrive on the scene. <laughs> this angel had been planned. He had been sent. It had been prophesied because angels are God's messengers. He was there to send the, the people here a message from God. The message that the tomb was empty and the prophecies were fulfilled. He had a job to reveal to this, these women exactly what had happened to Jesus. And he wanted to be sure that the evidence was clear, that they had seen it with their own eyes, and that they were then ready to go and tell others about how this prophecy had been fulfilled. You know, we look back and we say, okay, I didn't see it with my own eyes. I'm one of the recipients of that message. Just like originally, only the women saw the tomb. Of course, we know Peter and John eventually came and they saw with their own eyes. But there were a lot of people who became believers, even in the early church, that didn't see that tomb that day, didn't hear that message from that angel in a personal way, but they were recipients of the message. They got the message from someone else who passed it to someone else. And that went on and on and on through the ages until here we sit today. We got that same message that the tomb is empty, that the prophecies were fulfilled. That angel's message continues to ring for us today. But when we think about how Christ fulfilled this prophecy, we need to be often reminded of the fact that there are other prophecies in Scripture that are yet to be fulfilled. Are we always looking with eyes for fulfillment of prophecy? Are we watching for Christ's return? The Bible says that there is a day when Christ will come back to this earth and he will set wrong all of those things that are that set right all those things that are wrong. He will 
he will ultimately set up his kingdom here on earth. That's why in Mark 13, Jesus says to, to his disciples while he was still teaching, he says, Take heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house, gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. And what's the key word? Watch. See. Be looking. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Use your eyes. Be looking forward. Don't just be looking at what your life is about today. Be looking forward in time. Be anticipating a time when suddenly, without warning, Christ could return. Are we prepared for that today? You know, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, Christ could come suddenly. And you won't have that second chance. Today is the day that you need to know Christ as your Savior so that you can begin to be watching for Christ's return with anticipation, not with dread and fear. The angel wanted to have eyes of fulfillment of the prophecy. Then we see in verses 9 and 10, we see another who told us to watch in a different way. Verses 9 and 10, it says, As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. Jesus himself wanted us to come with eyes as well. And with the sake of his disciples, for the sake of giving evidence, he says, I want you to have eyes on my flesh, on who I am, my physical being, my physical body. That's why it's so clear in Scripture. It says when they saw him, it wasn't just like, oh, there's some vision out there. There's some ghostly presence, looks like Jesus. We'll count that as resurrected. No, Jesus says, I'm right here. <laughs> I'm going to be so close to you that you can grab me around the feet <laughs> and worship me. That's what it says they did. It says, they came and they held him by the feet. With their own hands, with their own eyes, they worshiped him. Physical touch, physical flesh and blood. Jesus Christ was resurrected. He was unfazed by that cruel punishment, the death that he endured, the entombment that he went through. He was resurrected. You know, I think this is one of the other great um, um, truths of the resurrection. And that is this. You know, there are some people who say, well, you know, Jesus, he, he was on the cross and his heart started to slow down and he went into a coma and so they took him down and they put him in this tomb and, you know, that cold air in the tomb and all that helped to revive him and he got himself awakened and got out of there and took these grave clothes off and he got, they, they want to paint a picture that he didn't arise, that he survived. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, what would a, Christ who survived look like <laughs> he would be trying to walk along with feet that were pierced by nails still dealing with those wounds hands that were still dealt with nails in them crowns of thorns stripes on his back all continuing and then sitting three days in a tomb what kind of Christ would that have been that wasn't the Christ these people saw the Christ they saw was a guy who had the wounds healed. He had the evidence, but not the infirmity. He walked with confidence. He walked with strength. He had power. He was a risen, a resurrected Christ. He, he had a, a new body that was in greater power than he had before he was killed. This was proof of the resurrection. He wanted them to see that he was not just a survivor, that he had been resurrected. His presence before them was indisputable proof of his resurrection. And you know, 
even though Jesus is not here in the flesh for us to grab at the, free, the feet of today, you know, he's promised never to leave us or forsake us. He's promised that when we accept him by faith, that he will be there in us. He will live in us. That he will empower us. He's promised that where two or three are gathered in my name, he says, I will be there in your midst. We have to recognize Jesus, his presence in our lives. When we uh, go off in the corner and commit our little sin and hide our little habits, we have to remember Jesus is there. He sees it. We sometimes think, oh, I can, I can get away with this. Nobody sees it. It doesn't hurt anybody. Nobody knows. The fact of the matter is, Jesus' presence, if you know the Lord, Jesus' presence is with you. <laughs> he doesn't get a place where you can escape him. So we need to see Jesus with eyes of flesh, as if he is there, because he is. And then finally, we look at one more example of another group, and that's towards the end of the chapter, verses 16 and 17. It says in Matthew 28, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. What did he want his disciples to see? His, they wanted to, he wanted his disciples to see that this wasn't an ending to the story. <laughs> he wanted them to see eyes, have eyes for the future. Eyes for what was coming next. You know, that day that he died on the cross, many of the disciples felt like, game's over. <laughs> Hope is lost. There's no chance. He's dead. It's all over. It's done. We're probably going to get persecuted and beheaded as well. But when Jesus Christ came back, when he showed himself to them, and then he put a purpose ahead of them that says, here is your future. Your future is through me. You need to have eyes for that future. And he gives them what we call today the Great Commission. Go into all the world. Teach all the nations. Baptizing them as I've commanded you. And what does he say? I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He says, I'm going to continue to be there. And every time you see a victory, every time you see, you see someone coming to Christ, every time you see me at work, you're going to realize that I am. <laughs> I am still active. Even though you won't see me in the flesh, you're going to see through all of these experiences that you have as a church that I am still there. Jesus, they're seeing Jesus started a, a movement of faith that ushered in the church age. And it's given hope to millions of believers for these past nearly 2,000 years. We wouldn't be sitting here today if there wasn't a resurrection. We wouldn't have a church building on this property if there wasn't a resurrection. Because there would be no truth to proclaim. There would be no hope to share. There would be no new life that we can have in Christ because our Christ would have been died and dead, buried, gone in the grave. No, we serve a living Savior. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And no matter where we go, if we know Christ, we know that we have him available working through us. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, he says, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. All that we believe hangs on the truth of the resurrection. Hangs on the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. And he sits now at the right hand of the God the Father, and he ever lives to intercede for us. You know, it's easy to say some of these things. It's easy to 
okay, it's, it's Resurrection Sunday. We're back in Matthew 28, and we're reading these words again, and we say, boy, it just doesn't seem, you know, it doesn't seem real to me. I mean, maybe it's a, a good story. It's something we like to remember. But the fact of the matter is, we've probably all heard these stories, if you've been in church much, all your life. The question is, what does it do to you? Is it just some kind of knowledge? Is it something you've read in the paper, but you've never really seen the picture? <laughs> you've never really said, hey, I've seen it. I, I, I believe it. And I've put my faith in the truth of it. That's what it takes to move from the fact that I just have a knowledge of God to say, I have a faith in God. What has God done to change your life in a personal way? Are these just facts and figures? Is it just opening up the book and reading things? The fact of the matter is we don't have the ability to go back in time and see what those women saw. To, to have the fear that was struck into the guards when, when they saw this angel descend. We don't have the ability sometimes to see beyond our own circumstances and our own needs. We don't sometimes see the fact that prophecies are, are, are waiting to be fulfilled. We obviously don't have Jesus in front of us to handle and to see him in the flesh. And sometimes because of all that, we don't see what God expects and wants from us in the future. That's why in John chapter 20, we have one of the most famous doubters explained to us and the situation there. In John chapter 20, of course, we know the story of one of his disciples whose name was Thomas. And it says in verse 24 of John chapter 20, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. He, he didn't get the benefit of seeing him in person the first instance. Verse 25, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. Well, good for you. I didn't see him. <laughs> that was Thomas' response. Good for you. You've seen him. It didn't change my life. I haven't seen him. He says unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. I need to see is what Thomas said. Verse 26, after eight days again, his disciples were within. Did you notice this? Eight days. Eight days this went on. Thomas says, I don't believe. <laughs> you guys have seen it. I haven't seen it. Eight days. And Thomas was with them. And then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Thomas saw, he witnessed firsthand, and he believed. But now look at Jesus' response in verse 29, because this is the most applicable thing for us today. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. That's a true statement. But what does he say? Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. He's talking about us. People that didn't get the chance to feel his nails. We didn't get the chance to see the tomb. We didn't get the chance to have that first-hand experience. He says, blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. That look at this not just as fairy tale, not just as narrative, not just as a good story to celebrate once a year, but rather a belief and a faith in a risen Savior who can transform your life. The fact of the matter is, all of us are sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for that sin because God's a holy God. He can't have sin in his presence. And we can't have a chance of having a home in heaven for, for eternity if we have that sin in us. 
So we have to be punished because God is a just and righteous God. That's why the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ paid the penalty, but when he rose again, he gave us the ability to have new life in him. And the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. That's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so Jesus says to us today, come, see me, believe. Have that faith in who I am and what I have done for you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can come to him by faith, even today. You can know. You can see by faith with those eyes of faith, and you can know with assurance that Jesus promised to come and to save you and to be born again can be yours today.